morning has broken like the first morning like bird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them springing fresh from Good morning, one and all. Welcome to our service on the 25th of April, 2021, uh, 10.30. We're starting on time this week. Welcome, and uh, good to see everybody here. Once again this week, we welcome Pastor Bill Dufay as our guest minister. Uh, Bill's with us today and will be with us again next week, uh, beginning in May. Uh, good morning to Bill. Uh, we call everybody's attention to announcements in the bulletin. And this is the time if you have announcements, we'll have joys and concerns later in the service. Uh, I'll just start with a few announcements here for the benefit of those who are watching remotely and do not have the bulletin. Uh, today is our annual meeting, which has been postponed a couple times. So after church at 12 o'clock today is our annual meeting and hope uh, everybody can stay for that. Uh, that is today at 12. Um, there is a meeting of Missions on Wednesday night, 6.30. Missions committee this Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, special thanks to the Warren family for providing these beautiful altar flowers this morning in memory of Shirley and Frank Warren, uh, longstanding members of our church. Linda, thank you to family and all for that. Uh, very beautiful. Do we have announcements, other announcements that are not in the bulletin? Um, I do. Jeanette. On Friday, the office is going to open later than usual, probably around 10 o'clock. What day was that? Friday. Friday. Okay, later on Friday. Gloria. Just again, pastoral search? Time capsule, time capsule, okay. That's coming up Tuesday. Okay, Gloria's kind of heading that plan up for our time capsule for the 200th anniversary of this church building. So this is the year to make your contributions to that and we may do something else besides the time capsule throughout the year. Other announcements? Uh, during the singing of the first hymn, if you have a yellow prayer request slip you'd like to turn in, I'll be collecting those during the singing of the first hymn. And you can also uh, verbally announce any prayer request and joys uh, as well later in the service. Uh, well, can I just say one more thing? Sure. Now that you brought that up, if you want your person to be on the written prayer list, I do need a paper for that because I don't have a record of it if you just say it verbally. Okay, thanks. 
Is that it for now? No announcements? One more. <laughs> this is our time. We've changed the order of worship a little. This is the time for the passing of the peace. Please stand up where you are. Greet each other with the passing of the peace. And uh, peace be with you. Now that we have light, let us have some sound as we join together in the call to worship. God, who has blessed us so richly in time past, we gather in the present to give thanks. God, who has promised us a future beyond, beautiful beyond any telling of it, we gather in the present in anticipation of God's gift. God, who is with us all the time, we gather together in the here and now with the one who is the here and now and in all of our tomorrows. As we finished that, I couldn't help but uh, <coughs> remember not only uh, Prince, um, you know, Prince Philip's uh, funeral last week, but all those who apparently perished in the submarine disaster in um, Indonesia. Let us continue now with the prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Gracious God, prodded by conscience and the action of your spirit in our hearts, 
In humility, we come before you to confess our sins. In the days just past, we have allowed our craving for power to bully others and casually dismiss other human beings. We have allowed anger to destroy our most treasured relationships. We have filled our minds with the world's bad news and failed to seize upon the good news in which our faith is grounded. Let our remembrance of these and other failings lead to a rediscovery of your infinite mercy. If you, O oh God, mark our iniquities, who of us could stand? Except we pray this our offering of confession. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beloved, rejoice always that there is more mercy in God than sin in us, and that we can claim God's assurance that all of our sins are forgiven. Let the whole church say, Amen. Amen. got two assistants and again one of them doesn't know what's going to happen and the other does isn't it fun Caitlin we have here a normal tube of toothpaste can you please open that you hold that. now I'm gonna ask you folks to help me out Caitlin when we say go I want you to squeeze that tube of toothpaste as fast as you can onto that plate. Are you ready? And you folks, I'd like you to help me count how long it's her to get out that toothpaste. On your mark, get set, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Pretty good? All right. That was pretty fast, huh? <coughs> good. Now, this is the fun part. What's in your pocket, Caitlin? A spoon. Now, Lydia, she's going to hold the plate for you. I want to count how long it takes Lydia to try and get that toothpaste back into the tube. Yeah. Are you ready? No? Well, that's fair enough. Maybe you should ask the big guy for help. <laughs> when I say go, we're going to count how long. Now, to be nice, we'll give you to the count of 20, and then you can stop. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, you can stop. You can just leave that there. Now, that's kind of a funny experiment, right? Except for, let's put this in other terms. Let's say that that tube of toothpaste was your words. They're really, really quick to come out, but once they're out, there's no getting it back in the tube. And all through the Bible, it talks about the power of words. 
You have Proverbs 11.9, evil words destroy one's friends, wise discernment rescues the godly. You have Proverbs 11.12, it is foolish to belittle a neighbor, a person with good sense remains silent. Proverbs 11.17, your own soul is nourished when you are kind, but you destroy yourself when you are cruel. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but hard, hard words stir up anger. Proverbs 15.4, gentle words bring life and health but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 16, 24. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Proverbs 18, 4. A person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. Proverbs 18.20 Words satisfy the soul as food satisfies the stomach. The right words on a person's lips bring satisfaction. Proverbs 20.15 Why speech is rarer and more valuable than gold and rubies. Proverbs 25, 18. Telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Now that's just 10 of some of the most powerful words in the Bible on using your words wisely. But like that tube of toothpaste, we often are quick to speak in anger but slow to give a compliment or to apologize. And once it's out of the tube, there's no getting it back. So especially on days where things are going a little crazy, take that time to breathe and say a prayer. Take that time to give a compliment where you see somebody doing something good. Because often, we don't notice the 99 good things they did, but the one bad thing. And it's very important that we try and amplify what God has told us in the Bible by being kind to others and respecting and keeping our words calm and steady so we don't end up like that tube of toothpaste. Amen. One other thing, I wasn't here when you were doing some of the announcements, uh, so I wanted to let you know that we were able to get some food parcels for those who may be in need um, there are some boxes over in the parish house. They've got some milk, uh, chicken, hot dogs, some other dairy products, onions, apples. So if anybody needs anything and would like to take one of those boxes, please just feel free to help yourself. They're in the large fridge. If you need help carrying it, we've got some strong arms around. And uh, we do have a few more if anybody is in need. Also, please remember that the table over there is for anybody who needs anything or if you know somebody who's in need, and you're welcome to that anytime that the church is open, and if not, you can call a member of missions and we will come and let you in. Thank you.
Good morning again. Uh, just looking ahead in the program, one correction for the closing hymn. The closing hymn is an insert in our bulletin. It's not number 90 in the, in the hymn book. So it's the insert. Reading from our first passage from the New Testament, we read from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoner stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the very cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. May God add his understanding to these readings. Amen. Before getting into the sermon, I thought it was kind of important to uh, talk just for a moment about the events of this past week, namely the trial of Derek Chauvin. You know, many times uh, in a number of places and settings, I've reminded people of the immortal words of the prophet Micah. He has showed you what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? For far too long, too many people have thought that it was enough to love justice and not do anything about it. The killing of George Floyd changed that, didn't it? And the ramifications of that tragedy have exploded not only across the state of Minnesota, throughout the United States, but even into Europe, and especially in France. Now, I know that the vast majority of our brothers and sisters were relieved and even joyful in the unanimous decision by the jury this week. I count myself among that group. I don't personally know of anyone who wasn't, especially those who noted Derek Chauvin's complete lack of emotion, not only when he took a knee, not to prayer, but on George Floyd's neck but in his reaction to 
the whole trial and even when his sentence was pronounced. And as relieved as I was at that decision, it occurred to me that though Chauvin appeared unmoved by the decision, there are probably a few folk who sympathized with him for any number of reasons. Maybe it was an accident. He was only an officer doing what he thought was his duty. His imagination, his conviction would weaken law enforcement. Possible explanations. Yeah, there are stretches of the imagination to be sure. And for those people who sided with Chauvin, uh, I'm sure they have their reasons. But what really scares me are those people who, when asked about their feelings at the Chauvin trial, said, I just don't care about such things. To say that, to believe that, is to surrender their God-given humanity in the same manner as Chauvin appeared to do. And my wish for all of you and for myself is that we challenge anyone and everyone who doesn't care. It's not enough to love justice. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? So that said, on to the sermon. In this morning's lesson from the Acts of the Apostles that was read for us a few moments ago, we heard Peter defending himself and his Lord before the Sanhedrin. As we all know, when one is compelled to testify before any governmental authority, the sheer weight of governmental presence is always stressful. To stand in the face of an inherently adversarial party makes it imperative to speak honestly with clarity and with charity. For Peter, one who had already yielded to pressure on three occasions, testimony before that august body was no mean feat. Despite his less than stellar record, it was his job to do the best he could. And surprisingly, perhaps, he rose to that occasion. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. There was a slogan popular with us reverend types some years back that God don't make no junk. And nothing has changed to alter that truth except that we have become a little bit better in finding better ways of saying the same thing, hopefully with words that don't make English teachers cringe. The theme of utter human sinfulness to the point where a sinner is of no value whatsoever is rampant among fundamentalist ranks. And it's one of many reasons why more thoughtful Christians don't feel at home in fundamentalist settings. We don't argue the point that we are all guilty of sin, but rather stress the fact that we are indeed beloved and useful in God's sight. God wouldn't want to work with junk. And that's one reason why I personally don't like the hymn Amazing Grace, because it feeds the worthless attitude so popular in some Christian circles. And for years I've wrestled with this issue, and the answer came to me, Outside of my usual spiritual pursuits, it came from my shop. Let me explain. I don't think of myself as a squirrel, but I do find it hard throwing out something that I might find a later use for. <laughs> I once made a new bearing for our vacuum cleaner out of an old brass pipe fitting. On another occasion, I found that the roof rake that I bought was entirely useless on our house but with a little adaptation became a wonderful tool for cleaning out my gutters without having to get on the ladder. And many years ago, scavenging through my scrap box, I found a piece of an old gun barrel that made an excellent replacement for a poorly designed plastic fitting on my car's heater bracket. Now, if I tossed out everything that was broken, I might subscribe to the wretch theory in that old hymn. But just as psychologists always remind those who are depressed over their failures in life, having failed at something does not make one a failure. So whenever I sing Amazing Grace now, I do it. I remind myself to get over this wretch thing because God doesn't make junk. And I know that Peter had discovered the same truth between the time he denied Christ three times and as he became the head of the early church. God doesn't make junk, even when it looks like junk to us. Well, that was where Peter found himself when he was compelled to testify before the Sanhedrin. 
So what was it that made his appearance necessary? Peter and John were en route to the temple to pray, and you never know what might happen on the way to church. I've had some startling revelations from parishioners passing out when standing to sing a hymn, or the death of one worshiper at exactly the moment when the service began with one foot inside the sanctuary and one still in the narthex. There was even one occasion when five parishioners' cars were damaged in front of the church during my sermon, when an irate driver lost control of his car. The reason he did is because he had to drive his wife and mother-in-law to church. Well, old St. Peter didn't have a whole lot of luck this morning either. On their way to the temple, they came across a handicapped man begging at the temple door. The beggar asked the two for a handout, the only thing that kept him away from starvation. But instead of getting what he wanted from Peter and John, he got what he needed. He was healed. By the power of Christ in those two disciples, the one-time beggar did something he had never been able to do before. He got up walking and entered the temple to worship. Now that healing was not done in private. Many saw it and reacted in amazement. And therein was the root of Peter's problem. In response to their probing questions, that was the Sanhedrin, he embarked on a sermon to the Jews who gathered for worship. Peter's message, hard to hear as it was for those folk, was not lost on them. They took note of his comments and Peter and John soon found themselves formally under arrest. And when anyone dares to suggest then or now that there is a power, a power greater than the government, that person is at risk for arrest and sometimes a lot worse. This morning's lesson picks up at the point where John and Peter are brought before the Sanhedrin to account for their actions, the trial, if you will. Strangely to us moderns, only one question was, was put to them. By what power or by what name did you do that? Perhaps it was only what it seemed to be on the surface. In other words, are you blaspheming against the Jews or against Caesar? If the Sanhedrin found that either charge was sustained, Peter and John were in deep trouble. A yes regarding blaspheming against the Jews would indicate that they were indeed Gentiles, and a Gentile entering the temple could be found guilty and sentenced to death by the Sanhedrin, the only charge. Incidentally, that lasts to this day. If, however, they were found guilty of critiquing Rome. Then they could be turned over to Roman authorities who would be no less merciful. They were in a bind. But those two possibilities were only the tip of the iceberg because that was hardly the why of Peter and John's arrest. The establishment saw the burgeoning Christian community as an emerging threat to their well-being. And so they pursued every opportunity to discredit this troublesome new religion. After all, the healing of the beggar alone drew thousands of converts. Secondly, it was not unknown to them that Peter had already cracked under pressure, and he was a good bet to do it again, especially before the awesome power of the Sanhedrin. If he denied Jesus in their presence, then Christianity in Jerusalem would be mortally wounded if not destroyed. But if he stood by Jesus, then his testimony could be used against him. There was no Fifth Amendment. Peter was between a rock and a hard place. In any case, what was at the bottom of this can of worms was that the establishment knew it was in trouble. For centuries, the priesthood was a matter of heredity. And in reality, there were four families in Jerusalem who provided virtually all of the high priests. We still see this phenomenon in some of our small churches where the worship is not directed toward Jesus Christ, but to the family that controls the congregation. And incidentally, my first call involved exactly that kind of a church. I know a little bit about how it works, and it ain't pretty. Now, the priestly families, the Sadducees, wanted to preserve their legacy, their livelihood, and indeed their stranglehold on the people and on the temple. Not being willing to share the power, 
they had no alternative but to put up a fight. And it's interesting to note that before the next century elapsed, no one mentioned the Sadducees anymore. They were gone. Cer certainly, Peter understood the dynamics of the power struggle. But I think he understood a great deal more about the process than his adversaries did. Surely when he was summoned to appear before that body, his sense of remorse for having denied Jesus three times before came rushing into his consciousness. It might happen all over again. So not only was Peter defending Jesus, Peter was defending Peter. The name of Jesus had gotten him in trouble before and it seemed to be back with a vengeance. What would happen this time, Peter wondered. But fortunately for Peter, he had really matured in those days. He had grown spiritually, he had experienced the risen Savior, and he was ready. Never being at a loss for words, Peter turned the tables on his critics. When they asked him, by what power or by what name did you do this, Peter's reply was both humble and cutting. The verbal response merely asked for a clarification as to whether he was on trial because of something he did. But the hidden agenda coming out by the nature of his response and the indictment that followed could have been phrased, why? Am I rattling your precious little priestly cages a little too much? Peter seized the opportunity to deliver yet another sermon and right there in front of the most powerful audience he had ever encountered. From the relative safety of a small close-knit community to the cold hostility of the seat of government, Peter was ready. His response, a mini-sermon if you will, laid forth his own indictment of the Sanhedrin. This is a stone which was rejected by you builders, but which has become the head of the corner. He didn't mince words in laying the blame for Jesus' death at the feet of the Sanhedrin, nor did he cop out again in denying Jesus. Rather, he understood the centrality of Jesus in the life of the newly established Christian church. And that was not comforting for the Sanhedrin, who eventually ended up trying to let the whole matter die a quiet death, as Peter and John were released with nothing more than a gag order levied against them. Can you imagine putting a gag order on Peter? The Sanhedrin was thoroughly impressed with Peter's testimony, and the metaphor of the cornerstone was not lost on them. And today we need to know what they knew that made such a, dis a difference and such a lasting impression. What did Peter mean when he spoke of the head of the corner? Since we do have to deal with translations from Greek, it isn't possible to know exactly, but I think that vagueness makes the lessons even more powerful because we can understand it in several ways, all instructive for us. He may well have been talking about the cornerstone, that large piece of material into which on occasion a time capsule may be placed. In Peter's time, however, the cornerstone was merely an enormous piece of rock that, because of its sheer mass, held the weight of the entire structure. And even today, the cornerstone or cornerstones are immensely important. Using a more literal translation from the Greek, namely, the stone which is the head of the corner, indicates a uniquely shaped stone that, because of its odd shape, ties the sides of a building together. This stone placed atop a wall guaranteed that the walls would not separate when stress was applied. Thirdly, Peter may well have been thinking of the stone we modern folk think of as a keystone. And the keystone is a particular piece of rock at the top of an arch which gives integrity to the entire arch. Remember that in Jesus' time, builders didn't have the strong structural members that could be placed over doorways as carrying beams. All stone buildings used arches where many small stones would be compressed together, providing a very strong configuration. And at the top of each of these arches, then and now, there was a uniquely shaped keystone that tied the arch together. Without that keystone, the arch had no strength. And for those of you familiar with Pennsylvania, that is their state symbol. I hope you see what I'm suggesting. It's indeed a beautiful image to describe our Lord. The cornerstone, 
the one upon whom all the weight of the world is placed, the head of the corner, the unique one who pulls and ties everything together for the benefit of the whole body, the keystone, the one upon whom everything else depends on for its integrity. It is truly Jesus who takes the weight of the world on his shoulders, who binds us together with strength and is always there that we might lean on him. But, and it's a big one, when we lean on him, we run the real danger of stopping at the beginning. And that reminds me of a longtime friend of mine, a pastor of like mind, who was having an intense dialogue with another clergyman, one noted for his evangelical orientation. Now, my late friend, who never missed a golden opportunity for a productive conversation with those Christians who were alike in substance, but as different as apples and oranges in the way they approached ministry. And there were times when those conversations got really testy. On one occasion, this is what happened. Instead of taking the tack of lesser men, he rose to the occasion saying, Brother, you do a great job of leading people up to the altar, to the gate of faith, as it were. But then you leave them there. No place to go. Nothing to do. It's all over. He might have said the same, same thing in different words. That faith is not the end of a spiritual beginning. It is a journey. It is only the beginning. Now I have to admit that I'm less than impressed with many of the daily devotionals that the UCC puts online every morning. But one of them was really terrific. And it appeared right after Easter. The author said, and I can't remember the exact words, but she said that on Easter, we rightly proclaim that Christ is risen. And when we say that Christ's body is risen, then we who are the body of Christ are also risen. No big deal. We are risen to be the arms and legs of our Lord in the world where we find ourselves. That means work. Work motivated by love feeding the hungry, giving sanctuary to those who have no home, physically, politically, or spiritually. It means taking our Christian convictions into every venue, speaking truth to power, and to always contend against the wrong without becoming wrongly contentious. Well, as Peter was moved from passivity to action, so too must we carry out indeed what we so easily recite in the safety of our sanctuaries. It is our calling to see beyond sight, to walk beyond our capacity, and to live well beyond our means for Jesus' sake. But with him sharing our burdens, with his belovedness bringing us all together, with his abiding presence giving us the strength we need every day and every moment, we need not fear though the earth should move, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, we prepare ourselves for prayer, and we do that by sharing our joys and concerns. I also, I have several that are here, and that's fine. I will read them during the, um, during the prayer. I also will have that time of silence during the prayer for us to lift up those um, concerns. Uh, are there any others that should be added? Let us be together now in prayer. 
Ever gracious God, who has blessed us with a world beautiful beyond any telling of it, we come to you this day in prayer, mindful of your eternal connection with us, we, your beloved children. We come to you this day with gratitude for all those people who fight valiantly for justice the world over, for those who dare to challenge the status quo with cries for justice, for those who put their lives on the line to protect injustice, to protest injustice, for those who, though they can only do a little, give it everything they've got in pursuit of your righteousness. And we pray earnestly for those untouched by human suffering, for an awakening into how things really are as your beloved children. We thank you this day for the warmth and sunshine of recent days and the rain today and all those things that make the forsythia bloom as never before, for the rhododendrons to blossom with a beauty unimaginable, for the trees to once again begin to turn green in anticipation of the warm days of late spring and summer. As we begin to loosen the bonds that have confined us with the pandemic and begin venturing out, however timidly, to re-experience the freedom of a non-pandemic life, we would be ever grateful for your creation all about us and within us. Mighty one, we would be remiss if we didn't hold out our hopes and prayers for all people facing the challenges of life. For national and local leaders who wrestle with issues of proper policing procedures in the wake of the Floyd killing, and for those same leaders who confront the rampant issues of gun violence, especially in the ever-increasing incidences of mass shootings. And we would lift up in prayer the whole medical community as they wrestle with the ongoing pandemic in so many places and in so many settings. We would especially pray today for all those who perished in the two hospital disasters, the nearly 100 in India and the 100 in Iraq this morning. We pray for all those who work to care for others. And ever healing God, we look to you now to extend your healing hand to all those people near and far for whom we would lift up our personal prayers. Now, either in silence or loud, we would invoke the names of those sisters and brothers for whom we would pray together. Trudy, Christine, for Betty, and for Dawn, and for all those people we might name now. O oh God, now bless us also as individuals, as congregations, and as the whole people of God, however defined, as we bring these words of prayer to a close in the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us remember also now that while we don't take an offering during worship, there is the basket outside and we would now offer a prayer of dedication for those gifts either there now or those that will be arriving later. Let us pray. Oh God, we dedicate to you these offerings, the offerings of our treasure, of our time, and our talent. 
We ask you to bless this in the church that bears your name. And also accept the gifts that we offer every day in your name. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And again, that last hymn is in your insert. joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for an everlasting sign which shall never be cut off. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.